Hello everyone, my name is Gautam Tsumbada and I'll be talking about benchmarking post-quantum cryptography in TLS. This is joint work with Christine Paquin of Microsoft Research and Douglas Tabila of the University of Waterloo. Our main goal in this paper was to measure the effect of network conditions on TLS handshake completion times for various post-quantum key exchange and signature algorithms. We restricted ourselves to network latency and packet loss rate as the two parameters in combination can be used to represent a wide variety of network conditions. The round trip time on a link is the geographical distance between a client and a server. And on top of that, for example, a low packet loss rate can model a wired ethernet connection at the client side, and a high packet loss can model either a low quality connection at the client side or a congested network where the server is experiencing heavy traffic. This focus on network conditions means that in this paper, we do not consider the effect of processing power at the client or server endpoints, nor do we consider the effect of the different post-quantum algorithms on server performance. Now, let me briefly go over some of the other work that has been done in this space. Boss, Costello, Nerig, and Stabila in 2015, and Boss, Costello, Duca, and others in 2016 measured the impact of their proposed post-quantum key exchange schemes on the performance of a heavily loaded Apache server that was running TLS 1.2. Kampanakis and Sikoridis in 2019, and Sikoridis, Kampanakis, and David Sikiotis in 2020 measured the impact of post-quantum signatures in TLS 1.3 on handshake time, on the handshake failure rate, and on uh, throughput for a heavily loaded server. Google and Cloudflare have also carried out several internet-wide experiments in order to quantify the impact of post-quantum cryptography. In 2016, Google configured a small fraction of connections between desktop Chrome and its own servers to use New Hope along with Curve 25519 in TLS 1.2. In 2018, a fraction of Chrome installs were configured to send a so-called dummy TLS 1.3 extension that could have anywhere from 0 to 3,300 meaningless bytes to reflect the overhead that post-quantum cryptography would impose. The handshake latency was correspondingly measured. In 2019, Google Chrome installs were randomly assigned to make NTRU, HRSS, or site connections, all in hybrid mode with Curve 25519. Cloudflare servers were correspondingly updated to include support for both of these algorithm combinations, and of course, the relevant measurements were taken. So, what if you want to do network experiments, but you don't have the sort of network infrastructure that Google or Cloudflare do? Well, you could do what the net mirage and many net tools do, emulate the network. This gives you much greater control over the experiment parameters. You can precisely determine the network topology, the behavior of the clients and the servers, and the characteristics of each link in the network. It is thus also easier to change the parameters and reason about corresponding changes in the output. For example, after increasing the packet loss rate by 1% on a link, if the handshake time goes up by 5 milliseconds, you can establish a causal link between the two events, which is something you can't necessarily do in the internet-wide experiments, where at any given time, there could be multiple explanations for a trend in the output data. Of course, network emulation also results in a loss in realism. It is not at all trivial either to model realistic network topologies or to model the behavior of realistic clients and servers, not to mention the devices that are probably on the path between them, such as proxies and routers. Here's an overview of how network emulation works in Linux, which is the platform on which we ran the emulation experiments. The Linux kernel offers the ability to create what are called network namespaces. These are logically independent copies of the network stack, with each one having, among other things, its own routes, firewall rules, and network devices. Virtual Ethernet devices offer a way to connect to namespaces. These devices are always connected in, interconnect in interconnected pairs, and packets transmitted on one device in the pair are immediately received on the other device. Two network namespaces can thus be connected by placing one end of a virtual Ethernet pair in one network namespace and the other end in the other network namespace. Then, the NetM or the Network Emulation Kernel module can instruct the kernel to apply a specified delay in packet loss probability to all packets outgoing from a virtual Ethernet device. For example, to give a link between network namespaces a round trip time of 10 milliseconds and a packet loss rate of 1%, both devices of the virtual Ethernet pair can be instructed to add a 5 millisecond delay to their outgoing packets and to drop their outgoing packets with a 1% probability. 
I also want to note that in this paper, we always specify their probability to apply independently to each packet. Our emulation experiment was set up as follows. We created two network namespaces and connected them using a virtual Ethernet pair, one namespace for the client and the other for the server. In the client namespace, we ran a modified version of OpenSSL STime, which we call STimer. Our modified version synchronously establishes TLS connections for a given post-quantum algorithm and number of repetitions, and most importantly, closes the connection as soon as the handshake is complete. No application data was, is exchanged because we wanted to specifically determine the effects of the link round trip time and packet loss on the handshake time. In the server namespace, we ran the Nginx web server. All of these programs were built against OQS OpenSSL 1.1.1, which is an OpenSSL fork that adds post-quantum plus classical key exchange and authentication to TLS 1.3. We chose a simple network topology to enable us to better isolate the effects of individual network characteristics on the results. Here's a graphical depiction of the experiment setup. For every server process, we had roughly two S-Timer client processes communicating with the server over a virtual link that applies to specified delay and packet loss. I want to talk a little bit about the experiment parameters. We ran an Internet Data Center experiment in which we placed a client VM in Virginia and disperse the server VMs around the world. I will describe this experiment in more detail shortly, but for now I'll just say that these locations were chosen to reflect the best and worst case round trip times a client could experience in its connections. It was these corresponding round trip times that we used in our emulation experiment, but the values did not match exactly because NetM internally converts a given latency to an integral number of what are called packet scheduler ticks, which resulted in a negligible accuracy loss. For each of these round trip times, the packet loss probability was varied from 0 to 20%. For some context on the choice of this range, here's a graph of the data collected by Mozilla on dropped packets in desktop Firefox between September and October 2019. Of the 35.5 million samples collected, 67% of them had a packet loss less than 0.1%, 89% had a packet loss less than 1%, 95% had a packet loss less than 4.3%, and 97% of the samples had a packet loss less than 20%. For the key exchange experiments, we used ECDH with NIST's P256 curve as a baseline for comparison against level 1 Psych, Kyber, and Frodo, all in hybrid mode with ECDH P256. This allowed us to observe the effects of a range of trade-offs. On the one hand, Psych has small public key and ciphertext, but imposes the greatest computational demand of all the chosen algorithms. On the other hand, Frodo has very large public key and ciphertext, but is much faster than Psyche. Meanwhile, Kyber, while having slightly larger public key and ciphertext sizes than Psyche, is much smaller than Frodo and is also faster than Frodo. We focus on hybrid key exchange because it is our perspective that early adopters of post-quantum cryptography may still want to use ECDH key exchange in conjunction with the post-quantum ones because of the relative novelty of post-quantum hardness assumptions. We also used ECDSA P256 as a signature algorithm throughout the, entire, throughout the entire key exchange experiments. For the signature experiments, we used ECDSA with P256 as a baseline and chose algorithms presenting a similar range of trade-offs. We considered post-quantum only algorithms because authentication only needs to be secure at the time a connection is established rather than, rather than for the entire lifetime of the data. Here, we used hybrid mode Kyber 512 as a key exchange algorithm. With all of that said and done, here are the experiment results. Let's start with the median TLS handshake at the smallest RTT, and let's only look at ECDH and hybrid mode Frodo, which are represented by the black and blue lines respectively. On the x-axis is the packet loss rate, and on the y-axis is the handshake completion time in milliseconds. As we can see, at packet loss rates up to 8%, Frodo only takes slightly longer than ECDH. Past that, however, the median Frodo completion time starts to fall behind. This is because the maximum transmission unit of an Ethernet connection is 1500 bytes, which means that the client has to send 16 IP packets to establish a TLS connection with hybrid mode Frodo. By contrast, the client only has to send 5 IP packets to establish a TLS connection with ECDH P256. This difference becomes starker as the RTT increases as we can see in going from 31.2 milliseconds to 78.7 milliseconds, 
to 195.7 milliseconds. Frodo's handshake completion time shoots up faster at packet loss rates above 5% and higher. Also note that the y-axis range for the bottom two graphs is, is larger than for the top two. Now let's add Psyche and Kyber to the mix. Psyche is represented by the red line in the graphs and Kyber is represented by the green line. We can see that Kyber fares better than all the other post-quantum algorithms, which is reasonable since it's relatively fast and produces small public keys and ciphertext. However, at 16% packet loss, it even momentarily does better than ECDHP256 at, for some of the RTTs. This is noise due to the high variability inherent to our measurement process. To mitigate against this variability, we took 4,500 samples for each key exchange and packet loss rate pair. But this meant that, especially at packet loss rates of 15% and above for algorithms like Frodo, it could take two to three hours to obtain the data for a single packet loss rate. Furthermore, we also see that Psyc has a higher latency floor in all of the graphs, and its performance only approaches that of Kyber's at high round trip times and packet loss rates. This is because five IP packets are required to establish a TLS connection with hybrid mode Psyc, and six are required for hybrid mode Kyber, which means that Psyc's small public key and ciphertext sizes do not significantly offset its computational demand in comparison to Kyber. We have a slightly different situation at the 95th percentile. We see that the impact of cryptographic processing is nearly eliminated, and up to packet loss rates of 10%, the performance of the four key exchange algorithms is pretty close. Past 15%, however, the much larger, num the much larger number of packets causes Frodo-based handshake completion times to spike. We also see similar trends for authentication algorithms. Here, we provided the median and 95th percentile graphs for lower latencies, and those for the higher latencies can be found in the paper. At the median, dilithium imposes the least slowdown of all post-quantum signature schemes and is neck and neck with ECDSA at low latencies and packet loss rates. Qtesla results in a higher latency floor and the performance of Picnic, which produces 34,000 byte signatures, degrades rapidly as the link round trip time and packet loss probability increases. At the 95th percentile, the performance of all the algorithms is similar until about 10% packet loss, where again, Picnic starts to shoot off. In practice, the latency of establishing TLS might not be noticeable when compared to the latency of retrieving application data over the connection. To investigate this, we conducted experiments that involved a client cloud VM requesting web pages of different sizes from various server VMs scattered across the globe and measured the total time to receive the complete file. We set up one Azure client VM in Virginia, in the United States, which ran the Apache benchmark tool, modified to be post-quantum aware. We then set up four Azure server VMs in locations ranging from the US, which is close to the client, to Australia, which is on the other side of the planet from the client. We installed Nginx on all server VMs and configured it to serve HTML pages of sizes ranging from one kilobyte to 1,000 kilobytes. The packet loss on these links was practically zero. Here are the results of this experiment. Again, let's start with the median connection at the smallest RTT. The same line colors are used as in the emulation experiments, although it may be hard to see for the non-psych algorithms since they are so similar in performance. The x-axis represents the web page size in kilobytes on a logarithmic scale, and the y-axis represents the time in milliseconds taken by the client to retrieve the, in the entire web page. We see that at the median, the TLS handshake constitutes a significant portion of the overall connection time. Faster algorithms perform better both at this RTT and at the 30.9 millisecond RTT. As the RTT time increases to 70.3 milliseconds and above, the handshake time becomes less significant. These observations also hold for the signature algorithms. Also note that as the page size increases, the effect of the handshake time becomes much less pronounced. Behavior at the 95th percentile is not far from this median behavior, likely due to, the, due to the extremely low packet loss rates on our connections. These corresponding graphs can be found in our paper. We drew the following conclusions from the emulation and data center experiments. On fast, reliable network links, the cost of public key cryptography dominates the median TLS establishment time, but does not substantially affect the 95th percentile establishment time. On unreliable network links, however, 
communication sizes come to, come to govern handshake completion time. And finally, as application data sizes grow, the relative cost of TLS handshake establishment diminishes compared to the cost of application data transmission. As for our next steps, it is certainly high on our list to rerun the experiments with the round three submissions. Also, now that we've gained some confidence in network emulation, we want to take on bigger network topologies that emulate multiple network conditions simultaneously using such software as NetMirage or MiniNet. We'd also like to investigate post-quantum cryptography in protocols such as SSH, IPsec, and WireGuard with our emulation framework. And that's our presentation. You can find more details in the paper, and all the software we used is available on GitHub. You can run the experiments for yourself, and comments and pull requests are always welcome. Thank you for watching.